Psalms chapter number 52. <clears throat> Don't have time to read the whole chapter. We'll begin in verse number 7. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself and his wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. Now, the whole chapter of this psalm starts off talking about the wickedness that man trusts in that he describes here in verse number 7. He says, this is the man. Okay, he didn't say that is the man. He said this is the man. Meaning that any man is capable of doing this. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter how much money you have in your pocket. You can still trust in your riches. Even if you're not rich. You can still trust in your strength. Even if you're really not all that strong. Okay, let's go back to verse number. This is the man that made not God his strength. The only condition there is that we don't do what we just sang about. What's that? Trusting Jesus, that is all. Right? Lo, this is the man. Yeah, that word lo means in context, stop, turn aside, and take a look. Meaning that man made a spectacle of himself. Not a good one, but a catastrophe. Right, but the sad's not here, so I'll talk about it about NASCAR. The only reason people watch NASCAR is why? The wrecks. Right, in fact, I saw a very convincing argument that one time, after they made the car safer, after Dale Earnhardt died, that's when NASCAR's popularity started going down because everybody knew it wasn't as dangerous anymore. It wasn't as interesting. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's just the argument. Right? People don't watch it because going, you know, turning left is all that hard. People don't watch it because going 200 mile an hour is all that hard. Now, it's hard to do all them things at once. Right? I can wrap my head around going 200 miles an hour. I'll never do it because then Christian would be peeling me off the, you know, side rail or a tree or whatever it was that I hit when I went off the road. Right? I can imagine going left, do it all the time. Can't imagine going left at an angle like this. But people look at it and they're just driving cars. So what's the intrigue? It's the danger. It's the wreck. Right? The race is going on. Don't pay attention to anything but the race. But a wreck happens. Lo, everybody looks at the wreck. Right? It's a spectacle. That's what the man who trusts in his own strength. That's what he becomes. For a while, it's nothing all that different. Right? You could fool the world. You could fool me. You could fool the pastor. You can fool yourself, but you can't fool God. For a while, everything may look the same on the surface, but all it takes, with them cars going so fast and turning with such forces on a car, literally, a little piece of gravel on the road can cause one of them tires to get loose, put somebody into the wall. car doesn't even have to touch it. You don't have to turn the steering wheel. You don't have to brake at the wrong point. It can just be something on the road. Well, how often do we think, well, that road, we're on a road called straight. How hard can it be? Right? Well, the problem is, is that you and I got a real bad habit that usually most people, when they first get their permit, have. I don't know how this became about cars, but it's working, so we're going to keep going with it. Okay, somebody gets a permit, Brother Brian, what do they do? When they look left, their hands go left. The car starts moving when they turn their head. Right? They look to the right, the steering wheel's coming to the right with you. you got these, no, no, no. Steering wheel stay, head move. Right? That's just instinct. Right? If I'm looking to the left, that means I must be going to the left. My body turns to the left. My hands go to the left. Right? You have to overcome that when you start driving cars. Or else what happens? You look left, you end up in the ditch. Well, we as Christians, we got a looking problem. We've got a thinking problem. Right? I don't wrestle against 
flesh and blood don't wrestle against really I don't wrestle against Satan or any of the demons of hell why because they can't come to me unless God approves it if I am entangled with them God knows that he's already equipped me enough to where I can endure it overcome it or sit there long enough with patience that he show up and overcome and don't wrestle what do I wrestle with my own flesh Right, I wrestle with the lust of this thing that doesn't want to admit it's dead, even though it is dead and trespasses to sin, and it wars against the inner man. But lo, take a look at those that they gave up relying upon the Lord's strength. I can handle this. It's not that hard. In theory, being a Christian, it's not rocket science. Right? He made it a way that anybody can understand how to live a life that's pleasing unto God uh, in fact we've heard it said they studied all the versions of the Bible that have been translated and perverted you know which one has you know a surprisingly low comprehension level your King James Bible it says it's written on you know about the reading level of a third grader an eight year old you say, well, that's not that complicated. No, it's not that complicated. It's just people don't want to understand it. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Well, lo, the man that trusts in his own, he doesn't want to seek. doesn't want to ask. He just wants to go and do. Okay, then we go on. But trusted in the abundance of his riches. See, that's one of the things we start bargaining in our minds. We start, you know, contending with our own Understanding, and we start trying to shut up the Holy Ghost. We say, well, I may not be strong enough, but God's blessed me with so much. Surely this will help me. Well, God may bless you. Hallelujah. Don't spoil the riches. I don't take for granted what God's blessed you with. But your blessings aren't there to help you overcome. Your blessings are there for God to provide for you. Show me where a blessing ever is something that God gives you specific to help you get over something that he doesn't give to anybody else. No, he's no respecter of persons. Right? Show me where trusting in the Lord means you get everything you need before you face it. That's not faith. Faith is doesn't compute. I don't know how I'm going to overcome. I don't know how this need's going to be met. I don't know how I'm going to come through this storm unscathed. But yet we trust because it is right. And then God does what we can't even conceive of in ways that we understand not. Why? Because he rewards faith. If he were to give us everything ahead of time and that would be enough, that's not faith. People would trust just to get the perks. Uh, you don't go to sign up for a mortgage and then the very next day God bless you with all the money to pay off the mortgage uh, not saying God don't want you to have the house that you have I'm just saying faith takes a little bit more effort than just signing on the dotted line or saying okay Lord we'll do it we have to show out our faith as James said I'll prove my faith by my works I trust God enough to keep trusting when it don't make sense but well, see, lo, this man who became an example, right, a spectacle, he trusted in the abundance of his riches. Okay. Trusted in the abundance of his riches. He thought he had more than he needed. He convinced himself that what he had was better than he would ever have it. He had made it, he had arrived. Now you give a kid a hundred dollar bill They think they've got enough money to make it Until they get to college Until they go out and see how much candy's going for nowadays And what they don't understand Is that it's going for more And the candy sizes are smaller than it used to be They don't understand that part But They say oh a hundred dollars isn't going to get me as far I remember when a hundred dollars Could get you a pretty good bike Obviously it's been a while since I've run, You know rode a bike But I remember Nowadays, you go and you just get one of the little foo-foo pink ones that has 
you know, the streamers and everything on it, charging ridiculous amounts. Made for somebody this big. But we think we have enough until we realize how hard life really is. What you think is abundance, God may understand. You're just going to need that to survive. That He's blessed you well above what we deserve. Everybody can admit to that. But why does He bless? Because He takes pleasure in us. He promised to meet our needs. He promised that He'd be there in the midst of the hardest moment. When everybody else would desert us, He'd still be just as close as He ever was. But see, we start valuing the blessings more than we value the relationship, and that's when we put our trust in our abundance. Most valuable thing you've got is your relationship with God. But when you start devaluing that, those things that God blessed you with or those things that you may have the means to go and get that you've always wanted, right? that still small voice, because you're not listening, isn't speaking and saying, you ought not go get that. You don't know what's around the next bend. You don't know there may be another Rona. What happens if this time you're the one that gets laid off? What if this time you're the one that not only gets laid off, your company can't afford to pay benefits. What if a Washington runs out of money and you don't get a stimulus check? You say, well, Brother Jordan, that's not going to happen. I don't know. But I do know if that's what's going to happen, the only chance you've got is faith in God. Same thing that got you through the last one. See, everybody got real nervous last time around until what? Until people started saying, it's okay, we're still going to pay you. Sign up for unemployment, we'll just guarantee you money. Well, then people were making more on COVID than they were working. That don't make much sense. But through all of it, those that thought they had enough, well, it's only going to last a month. Then the well starts running a little dry. Well, surely, surely it's got to be over now. Says who? Right? There's a big difference between trusting in the one that gave you your blessings and trusting in the blessings. And don't look down upon those that do or have in the past trusted in their blessings. It's real easy to do. David did it. David took for granted that God would let him win the battle of the kings. The war that was going on, he didn't even need to be there in his mind. Living in the most beautiful palace that God had ever let a king of Israel live in. Right? He's been blessed beyond measure. And yet, he wanted more blessings. And he's willing to kill in order to get them. You say, how'd that happen? The blessings meant more than the blesser. He wanted. But we all want. But what did he do? He dwelt on his desire until it became an action. What was he doing? He was trusting in his own strength to be enough. He was trusting in his own riches, his own abundance, to be the thing that kept him. He had great loyal men. In fact, Uriah, the one that he killed, was so loyal, David knew if he sounded retreat, he knew Uriah wouldn't back off. Those are the enemies of his king and his God. Uriah wasn't backing down. David knew that, took advantage of it. You know what happened after all that came to light? David's reputation was tarnished among the things that he counted as blessings. His people, his friends, his family. What did he do? He became a spectacle. But best part of the story is the latter half, David did more for God than he did in the first half. Right, God forgave him. Right, what did he do? He got right with God. He went on to do more for God. Twice as much as he did before. But why did it all happen? He got his eyes off of God. Which is why the latter part of seven said strengthen himself with wickedness. We know that our strength is the joy of the Lord. We know not to lean on our own understanding. And we could go back up and talk about in 
verses 1 through 7, or 1 through 6, how God takes the wisdom of man and turns it into foolishness. Fat eating. We don't have time to get into that. That's a rabbit. We don't have time to chase. Verse number 8. Okay, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Now here the psalmist, not bragging, he's saying, I've seen so many spectacles, so many disasters in people's lives. I've learned the truth. Okay, verses 1 through 7, he summarizes, he said, I've seen the ways of man, I've seen the ways of the world, I've seen the ways of those that thought they were right with God. He says, there's only one way that'll work, and that's being right with God. He says, I've seen the end of all of these ways. It's destruction. It's death. But he says, I found the way that you can continue to live. What kind of olive tree did he liken himself to? A green one. Things that are green are still growing. If something's green, it means it's not ripe yet. It means it's not ready to live on its own. He said, I want to be that growing olive tree. Man, I don't want to get too big for my britches to start falling off of the branch. Okay, because after all, we are grafted into the vine. Right, he's the true vine. You know what olives grow on? Vines. They got a whole bunch of them. That makes up a tree. But see, I'm just a part of it. He's the tree. Back. Don't have time to get back into it, but we had a revival meeting preacher preached one time. Jesus was the root and the seed of David. Right, what's that mean? He was the beginning and is the end of it. Right, he's the tree. What am I? I've just been grafted into the tree. I'm along for the ride. Now, it's all about him, but he made me a part of him. Where's this tree located at? The house of God. It's godly and it's green. It's not godly because of where it's located, but because it is godly, that's why it's located in the house of God. Right? Just because you're a part of the tree doesn't mean that automatically you've got some mega spirituality. No, but because you're a part of him and he's a part of you, you're going to be found in the house of God. Just because you're here doesn't make you anything special. What matters is, is where you're rooted at. Not where you position yourself. Not what you live like when you walk out here. What matters is what's down in here. Right? The real ones... They're going to keep growing. The real ones, they won't be moved. I'd be planted like a tree by the rivers of water. What's that mean? I've got everything I need right here. I don't need to look anywhere else. I'm a green olive tree. That means that I'm growing. That means I've got to make room to grow. If I'm positioned at the house of God, I find that all those things that I thought were worth taking up room in my life. Things that I thought these are worthy of me making space for these things in my life. I start to find out some of them things aren't as valuable. And in order to keep growing, I got to make more room. I've got to make more room for more of the Word, more of the Spirit, more of His desires, and less of what? Me. You know what happens when if you graft a branch into a vine? You really know what happens? The root of the big tree grows into the branch that used to be a part of something else. And what it does is as it grows, it takes the old branch and it just stretches it. There's less and less of it the more that you get into the new branch. Once it starts growing again, the old part because few and far between. The only thing that's left is what started growing on the inside of that old branch, which came from the new branch. What do you say? Like when you put air into a balloon. The bigger it gets, the less balloon there is at each spot. Then eventually you're just going to pop. 
Why? Because there's not enough balloon left to contain all that God's doing. That tree branch, it started off as 100% itself, but it became very little of itself the bigger it got. You may still be able to look at it and say, oh, well, that was an axe mark from when it was a part of the old tree. Yeah, but see, that axe mark is a whole lot smaller now than it used to be because it's been stretched out. You may still be able to see the marks. You may still be able to tell that that wasn't always a part of that, but you can't deny that now it's a part of the vine. You can see where it's attached to. He says, I want to be a green vine. That means God's ever working. He's always working, but ever working in you. And then, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Doesn't say the grace of God. God's grace, we got no claim to that. We've got no claim of mercy either, but we'll get to that here in a second. He says, I don't trust in what he blesses me with. That's icing on the cake. Doesn't say that he won't enjoy it. Doesn't say that he won't give God glory for it. Doesn't say that he won't use it for the honor and for the glory of God. But what's he say? My faith's not in the grace of God. It's not in the blessings of God. He says, I will trust in the mercy of God. Was that withholding what I do deserve? He says, my only hope is that God forgets what I used to be forgets what I am right now but yet sees what I can become through his son it says my only hope is that God doesn't see who I it, that that robe of righteousness doesn't fall off of me that's what he's saying he's saying my only hope is that if I do get something made right that God gives or, or get something wrong that God gives me enough time to get it made right because left up to myself I'm going to make a mess of this my trust is in the mercy of God that even when I deserve worse he withholds wrath and instead gives chastisement that he withholds judgment and he shows mercy that he corrects rather than just wiping us off the face of the earth you realize that we'd never have grace if it weren't for mercy and we'd never have mercy if it weren't for love. He's saying, I trust not only that God is love, but that God chooses to show me mercy. That's my only hope. He doesn't just say it once. Brother Mike, what's he say? Trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. He says, don't just you know, put one stamp on it. He says, we're all in. Saying, I'm not just saying, well, I'll trust in the mercy of God. And it, No, no, no. The only thing that's going to keep us in heaven after we get there is that God promised that He would forgive sins and that His Word is still good. Because if God's promises ever had an ending point when that happened, we'd get kicked out because of all the sinful, you know, wickedness we were before He saved us. It's all contingent upon God's mercy. Thankfully, it's impossible for God to lie. He said, whosoever come, meant whoever, whatever you did. But see, after you get saved, what are we still trusting in? The mercy of God. Some people start trusting in the blessings, in the grace. Now, the only hope we got is that every day, he will, <laughs> you know, long before I wake up, and however God's timeline works, Right? We know there's no morning or no night. It's just with him. It's always day. Right? So whatever point that God makes the, his trip around to Jordan and he starts looking through, well, he knows it. He doesn't need to look through it. But he starts going through all them promises. He said daily he renews his promises towards us. That daily he loadeth us with benefits. At whatever point I come up, only hope I've got is that God says, Let's show them a little mercy today. That's all I've got. Because without mercy, I won't get the blessings. Without mercy, I won't get what I need. Because He promised to meet our needs. Right, but what's the condition with that? That we trust in Him. Without the mercy of God, there's no reason to trust because we'd never receive. He could still be gracious, He could still be loving. 
They can still have a cattle on a thousand hills, but unless he shows us mercy, we don't get those blessings. He says, I shall trust in the mercy of God forever. This man who wrote the psalm understands why he is where he is because God had mercy. Somebody that remembers mercy remembers to worship. Somebody that remembers mercy remembers how little strength they really have. Somebody that knows about mercy and always has mercy in the forefront of their mind understands that in an instant it can all be gone. Right, one of them wildfires come through, wipe out everything you own, but leave neighbors on both sides alone. How'd that happen? Well, it happened because this world's spinning out of course because of sin. But see, if it happened to you, it's only by the mercy of God you weren't in the house when it burned down. It's only by the mercy of God that He'll take care of you afterwards. But all those riches, all that strength, all the ability that you have, it can be snuffed out in a moment. You can take everything I've got, you can't take away the mercy of God from me because He gave it to me. Only He can take it away. God can bless me with many things and I can spend it. I can ruin it. I can abuse it. I can neglect it. I can ruin the blessings of God in my life. I can't ruin the mercy of God in my life because I have nothing to do with mercy. You know what is required for mercy to happen? That God takes pity on us and that we ask for whatever it is, we need, whether it's forgiveness, right? whether it's for comfort, whether it's support, whether it's a prayer for somebody else. You do know that's why prayers get answered, because God's merciful. The mercy of God says, well, the wages of sin is death. They deserve, not just because of them being born in sin, conceived in sin, right, living in sin, but because sin is passed upon the third and the fourth generation, you may deserve what came forth in your life. It's only by the mercy of God that he would change that course. That through it, he would lessen the symptoms. That through it, he'd give you the strength to make it through. That Sister Mary, when they're injecting stuff in you that all it wants to do is, you know, say, feels like I'm on fire right now. Last thing I want to do is get up, walk around, sit in the pew all night, but he'll give you the strength to get here and to endure it. Why does that happen? Mercy. Mike, because I deserve death. Whether it's a short one, whether it's a long one, whether it's suffering, whether it's blessedly sweet, I deserve death. Or blessedly short, that's what I meant. Death never sweet. But through all of that, the reason your prayers are answered is because God realizes that we can't, never will be able to, and He has mercy. You know why God made all the promises in the Bible to you? Because He knew you needed them, and He had mercy on you. He knew you couldn't, but was willing to do it for you. He says, I'll trust in the mercy of God. You know that it's only the mercy of God that you've got a Bible in your life today that He preserved it to where you could read it? And what did He promise His Word would be? Lamp it your feet, light it your path. It's only by the mercy of God that He didn't leave you to your own understanding to figure out the Word of God. He sent the Holy Ghost to explain it to you. It's only by the mercy of God that you've got the strength to get up out of bed today but it's only the mercy of God that there's oxygen for you to breathe. If mercy is in the forefront of your mind, you understand where your strength really does lie. I may be able to pick up that speaker, right, but that can be gone in an instant. That strength doesn't lie in... But let's be honest, I'm not exercising. Right, that's fruit of the exercise I did a long, long time ago. That just still hung around. I, I might be able to do that today, but without work, I'm going to be able to pick up less and less each day. 
Right, but mercy understands if I need to pick that up and I don't have the physical strength, God tells me to pick it up. He's either going to give me the strength or He's going to send somebody by to assist me in what I wasn't able to do. What's that? That's faith. I know I may not be able to pick it up. I know I may not be able to pull it down this road. I know the cross may be too heavy for me to bear today. But I know that the mercy of God says that He won't let this life, this world, or this flesh overcome me. Why? Because He's merciful. That's why I'm just going to stick down into the house of God. So that's why I'm going to stay green. Something green can't be picked. It's not ready yet. It's not right. You know when we'll become right? When we become like Him after the rapture. Right? Whether we go through the grave or we go through the air, after He turns us, gives us that body like His, right? takes the old, turns it into the new. Right? We'll be quickly changed, the Bible says, if we go up through the air. What's He changing us into? The finished product. The ripe thing. Until that point, the devil can't pick me. God won't pick me. I can't even pick myself. Why? Because I'm green. Means that the tree is more a part of me than I am a part of myself. Because when a fruit becomes fruit, it falls. But at some point, that apple or that orange or whatever it is, it was a part of the tree. And the tree grew into the apple. But when the apple stops being a part of the tree, it becomes an apple. For that, it's just fruit of the tree. When it's green, it's got a whole lot of tree in it. Very little apple. What are you saying? They'll pick us when it's time. Don't worry about it. But in the meantime, I'm worried about as much strength and as much substance or abundance that he has, not what I have. I know if you were to pluck me off the tree, I can't help nobody. I'm not right. I don't have anything to offer. All I can do is say, hey, look at who attached me to himself. Taste and see that he's good, not that I'm good. Taste and see that if you put the seed that he left, this, into your life and let him work it, you can be just like him. But you know why all that's possible? Mercy. And he says, verse number 9, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name for it is good before thy saints. And he says, the reason for my praise is not because God has done... Okay, let's look. I will praise thee for, because thou has done it. God has done what? He's not talking about blessings. He's already, he's already said that his blessings don't mean you know the world to him. He praises God for him. He honors God for him. He takes care of it because God entrusted it with it. But his obsession, the thing that possesses him, isn't what God's blessed him with. What is it? It's his position. He's a part of the green tree in the house of God. He says, the reason I praise God is not because of what He's done for me. It's because He did the work that got me to where I'm at. He says, how did I become a part of a tree in the house of God? God did it. He says, I praise Him for what He's already done. And really what He's saying is, I praise Him for what He started. He said, I've never gotten away from the fact that I used to be outside, but now He's put me inside. That I used to be a stranger, a heathen, a barbarian, but yet now he made me one of his own. I'm a part of the tree. He says he took something that was so ungodly, but yet put God himself into it. So that the ungodly could become part of God. He says, I still can't get over that. He says, I don't have time to bless God for all this that He's done for me. He says, that blows my mind too. He says, but I just can't get over praising Him for what He's already done. 
But see, when it says that God done it, done is past tense. That means it can't be undone. He says, all the things that God's done in my life, you can take away the blessings. You can't take away the work that God did. He says, you can take away all that God's blessed me with, but he says, I remember the moment when he blessed me with it. He says, I remember where I was when he gave me that. That doesn't undo the fact that he already done it. You can take away the fruit, but you can't take away the root. He's saying, you can beat me. You can strip away everything that you think identifies who I am. And he says, but there's one thing that you can't ever undo. Things that God has done. I mean, do we need to go and compare verses? And if God established the house, who's going to topple it? Even the Pharisees said to Jesus, if it be a God, there's nothing we can do to stop it. And if it be a man, God will surely wipe it off the face of the earth. If God did it, it's done. You see, God doesn't unanswer prayers. God doesn't take the meaning out of the verses that He's given you before. But just because you may be cold today doesn't take the importance out of the fact that God showed up yesterday with a whole lot of warmth for you. See, once God does something, it's forever settled. Why do you think He tells us to go and set up pillars and monuments? Right? Moments in our life that were so special to us to memorialize them because He already did it. So why can't I trust Him that He'll do it again today? Matt, but Tommy, my car keys are over in the pew because I hate preaching with heavy pockets. Right? You could take them and you could drive off in a car. Doesn't matter the fact that God gave me that one. If God took it away, God will give me a new one. Why? Right, because He's already done it before. I know He can do it again. You can take the suit coat off of my back right, and all the ones out of my closet. Right? I may not be dressed as well as it was the last time, but God will give me what I need to come and worship and be right with God. You can take all I have. I know the one that gave it all to me in the first place. I'm not trusting in what he gave me. I'm trusting in his mercy and the fact that if he did it yesterday, he can do it today. If he did it a lifetime ago, he can do it today. If he did it a thousand years ago, God's the one that done it. Thou hast done it. That's what he's trusting. That's what he's praising him. God, you did it. And God's always present. So if he did it then, he can do it now, and he will do it if we need it. So that's why I'm trusting in the mercy. Because all this, it's all wood, hay, and stubble. He says, I'm trusting that he can give me enough wood to build what I need to live in. He can give me enough stubble to start the fires to keep me warm. He'll give me enough hay that I can eat it and make another step. But he says, but I'm just trusting in the mercy of God. Jesus didn't even have a pillow to lay his head on. Right? How much better do we have it than that? Yet we trust in what he's given us instead of who he put in us himself. He's a God that did a whole lot more. Right? He's a God that's done a whole lot greater. He's a God that's blessed in ways that we can't even comprehend yet how many of us don't receive and don't see it happen because we're not trusting in the mercy we're not praising him for what he did because when God does something he leaves a part of himself around right truly that's what it is he pours out his wrath he pours out his love right he sends himself right if God whispers to you from the that's literally God himself explaining it to you through the person of the Holy Spirit Right, we don't have time to get all the ways of what God does is God gives himself right when he's being merciful but if God did it that means it's a part of God yesterday and God can't change 
which means if God can't change, He can do it again today. The only thing is, either we don't need it to happen, or we're not positioned to receive it. Well, what's that mean? Well, I just trust that He'll teach me what I need to where I will be positioned when I need it. He's God. That's not the problem. What's the problem? Me. Never a problem with Him. I'll trust in His mercy that He can make me into what I need to be to where I can receive what I need to receive. Because right, He's already done it. If He did it once, He can do it forever. Okay, well, look at the last part. He says, I will wait upon thy name. Doesn't say I'll wait upon thy hand. I'll wait upon thy name for it is good before the saints. Two things. What does he wait on? The very name of God. He says, I'm not trusting, I'm not waiting for the hand of God, not waiting for the man of God, not waiting for the revelation of God. He says, I'm waiting on God himself to show up. You do know what you know, Jehovah means the one that lives because he's the only one that's alive forever and ever. You know what Jesus means, right? God with us, Emmanuel. He's saying, I'm waiting on the very name of God. Well, what is the very name of God? That he's alive. That he promised he'd be with us. He's saying, I know that God promised if I'm at the right place, or is that the house of God? If I'm in the right manner, which is what? Hooked up with God. That if I'm here, whatever I need is going to show up. Maybe correction, maybe instruction. May need to be rebuked. May need to get smacked upside the head every now and then. Right? May need to be humbled, may need to be strengthened. But all of it works to what? Edification. A stronger faith for you. He says, I shall wait upon thy name. One, because his name is good among his people. Right, you take it all away, but you can't take the fact that his name is wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Right, that he is the friend that sticketh closer than the brother. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. We don't have time to get into all of his name, but he says, thy name is what is sweet and good among thy people. But it's also good every now and then if somebody else is really having a bad day, they drug into the house. Right? It's all they're doing to cling on to that green vine. They're hanging on as hard as they can. It's good every now and then just for somebody else to say, just wait upon his name. I've been where you're at. I know how hard it is. Right? As hard as it was for you right now, believe it or not, it's hard, it's hard for me. Right? Life's hard for everybody. But he's in the midst of it all when I waited upon his name. Not his hand. Not his blessing. Not handouts. Right? I'm not here to see God's people. I'm here to see God. I'll wait upon his name. Right? For it is good before thy saints. Every now and then it's good to just wait so that other people can see faith still works. It's always good to wait on the name of God when other people are around. No matter what they're waiting on, no matter what they're hoping to see, because the one that waits upon thy name is a good example before thy saints. How do you think the next generation is going to learn to trust in the Lord unless they see people trusting in Him now? You can teach it all you want to until you live it. People really won't see it. People really do learn by doing, by seeing. And really, if you're learning by seeing, what are you doing? You're trying to do what you see until you master it. I could show you how to do something all day until you do it and figure out how to make yourself make the same things, do the same movements, right? Go through the same steps until you figure out how you can make that happen. It's not going to be any good for you. It's always good to wait upon the name of the Lord because right, it's good for the saints every now and then to just be reminded of why they are where they're at. Waiting on Him. 
Trusting in His mercy. Praising Him that the fact He did it yesterday, He can do it today. Whether I need it or not, He's capable. Right? When I praise Him for what He's done, I'm not praising Him for where I'm at. I'm praising Him for who He is. That removes me from the entire situation. You know, the psalmist, he says, I figured out the recipe. It's not about me, it's about him. And he said, I may be strong, but I'm still weak. He said, I may be wise, but I'm still ignorant. I'm a fool. Why? Because my natural man still wants to go back to the world. As much as I know about God, there's a whole lot more that I could. I'm foolish. In comparison to what the standard is, who's that? Jesus. I'm not strong. But I do have enough sense to know he's merciful. He's faithful. And after all that, he can make me fruitful. But to do it all, i got to be where he wants me to be in the right mindset that he wants me to be. Why? So that he can be glorified and get honor from this unworthy branch that he grafted into himself. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.